a protector. Exploring the expanses of space to keep our planet safe. And all the species that call it home. I am a healer. Giving doctors the vision to create amazing new cures. And using the heart's own magnetic field to diagnose itself. I am a guardian. Searching a mountain of data to keep us safe when we travel. and a sea of people to find a lost child. I am a helper. Powering autonomous machines that simplify our lives. our greatest adventures and make us whole again. I am a visionary, enabling taxis that don't need steering wheels those that don't need roads. I am even the composer of the music you're hearing. I am AI, brought to life by NVIDIA, deep learning, and brilliant minds everywhere. Welcome to GTC 2018. These are really exciting times. I have so much to tell you guys, so let's get started. Computing is the single most important tool of humanity. Without it, we can't advance society, we can't discover new science, we can't propel ourselves forward with more knowledge. For the last 35 years, we've relied on one fundamental truth that has continued to scale the computer industry, the advancement of Moore's Law. For 35 years, we can count on computers being 10 times faster every five years, 100 times faster every 10, 100 times faster every 10 years, like clockwork. And then in the middle part of the 2010s, year 2010, it started to slow down, and now it has essentially stopped. Moore's Law has ended, and we're now advancing computing at about 3% per year. 3% per year. And while demand for computing continues to grow, it would suggest that in order to keep up with that demand, computing cost would increase by a factor of 10 every five years. That's how it works. If computing cost doesn't continue to stay flat while computing performance increases, then when computing demand increases, then computing cost has to grow proportionally. Moore's law has ended during a time when computing demand continues to grow. We invented the accelerated computing approach. By focusing on one domain at a time and understanding the entire stack, from the application to the algorithm to the system, to the system software, to the processor architecture necessary to accelerate that application, one domain at a time, we were able to accelerate computing. By doing so, 
We created new algorithms, new approaches, new architectures, new acceleration techniques to propel advance in a way that nobody's ever seen. In 10 years' time, while Moore's Law has ended, our computing approach has resulted in a thousand times increase in performance. This idea of acceleration, accelerated computing, domain-focused accelerated computing, is now recognized as the path forward. We've been investing in this for well over a decade, and our architecture is literally everywhere. Over the course of time, we have advanced our architecture from CUDA 1 to now, this year, CUDA 10, which each step, we expanded the reach of our architecture, recognizing that we need to continue to obey the laws of an installed base to make it backwards compatible and forwards compatible. We continue to expand methodically from one domain after another domain after another domain. Our architecture has now great reach. Accelerated computing is our way forward at the end of Moore's Law. And then one day, one of the most computing demanding application emerged. A new way of developing software. A new way where software writes the software itself, called deep learning. This is the foundation of what is now known as AI. In deep learning, the software is written by an algorithm that was created by a computer scientist. And this algorithm would learn from a vast amount of data. And running on a supercomputer, it would generate new software. It would write software that no humans could write. And because of deep learning, it has enabled a whole new era of excitement. Computer scientists, system engineers, chip designers, there's a revolution afoot. The whole computer industry is so abuzz with the new possibilities of what's possible now with deep learning. All because CUDA existed, deep learning engineers were able to find our GPUs, and it revolutionized the way people do software. It ignited what we know now as the age of modern AI. Really, really exciting times. Two fundamental dynamics. On the one end, Moore's Law has ended, and we need a new computing approach. On the other hand, a brand new way of developing software altogether. How you build computer has changed, and how we write software has changed. Think about that. How we build computer has changed, and how we write software has changed. Almost everything has changed. And these two factors, these two forces, will affect the computer industry in fundamental ways, and is now, as a result, affecting every industry. I'd like to talk about some of that. GTC is where developers come to learn about accelerated computing, about GPU accelerated computing. This is where you come to learn about the latest state of the art in CUDA. And over the years, you could see that as computing capability has slowed, researchers had no choice but to reach out for another solution. And there was CUDA right there. And more and more people came to GTC. In the last five years alone, GTC attendance had increased sevenfold. And in the last five years, in the same five years, CUDA download has increased 5x. We're now expanded to reach so many different domains of science. Of course, computer graphics with ray tracing that I'll talk about in just a second. Material physics, bioinformatics, deep learning, medical imaging, computational chemistry, computational biology, computational physics, weather simulation. The numbers of fields of science that we address today is really, really exciting. And it's so great to have all of you here to talk to you about the next stage. Well, this year, we announced one of the most important GPUs we've ever created. And we named it after somebody obviously very important, Alan Turing. Turing is our brand new GPU architecture. It is a gigantic step forward. Five years ago when we started working on Turing, we were imagining what would the computer industry be like in 10 years' time. And we thought about how would we create a new type of processor that could allow us to continue to extend and scale beyond Moore's Law and solve problems that we couldn't otherwise solve in the past. And we came to the conclusion 
that this new processor has to be very different than the processor of the past, GPU of the past. We invented the programmable shaders that defines modern computer graphics. We did that about 15 years ago. And now this year, we introduced Turing, a brand new GPU architecture, and has three fundamental ways of computing. Three new types of programmable processors. First is a programmable shader that we invented. Second, a new type of processor we call the tensor core. A tensor core is a parallel processor that is optimized for deep learning. Its intention is to run deep learning as fast as we can possibly imagine. And the question is what its applications are, and I'll talk about that in just a second. And then lastly, the holy grail of computer graphics, something we've been wanting to do for three decades, real-time ray tracing. The ability to follow a ray through a scene, figure out where, which triangle intersects, and depending on that triangle and its orientation, this, and the, the material that, it's, that, that uh, the triangle is made out of, the geometry is made out of, decide whether you cast new rays, send off new rays, and in, in, in which direction. Ray tracing is computationally beyond imagination to do today. The combination of a couple of different technologies made it possible for us to make real-time ray tracing possible. These three processors, real-time ray tracing we call RT-Core, high-performance deep learning processor we call the Tensor Core, and then the programmable shader consists of the new Turing architecture. If you look at the computational horsepower that we're bringing to bear, this is the first processor that we have ever created, first GPU, that exceeds 100 trillion operations per second. 14 point something, floating point operations per second. A separate integer um, processor so that we could do address calculations at the same time, and the tensor core processor at a 114 teraflops per second. Incredible amounts of performance. Now the question is how do we put it to, to work? Turing is the first generation of GPUs that goes into three new markets at the same time. Because of its capabilities, we can expand into two brand new markets. The first one, of course, is to reinvent computer graphics, real-time computer graphics altogether. The look and feel with ray tracing is so vibrant, it just looks different. Just as programmable shading first came out, it made computer graphics look so fresh. Things were bumpy and shiny and live. It just popped out of the screen. Before that, it was kind of blurry and chalky. Now it's alive. And now with ray tracing, reflections will be realistic and interactive. Shadows will look beautiful. As a result, we'll bring a level of emotional content that is not possible before. It's just so much more beautiful. Second, for the very first time, we could do ray tracing fast enough that we could replace the millions of servers installed around the world that are currently doing things like film rendering. It's surprising, but the most computer graphics people see, which is in film, commercials, TVs, print ads, catalogs, most of those, well, all of those photorealistic ones are not generated by our GPUs. And the reason for that is because it requires real-time ray tracing, and it has to obey the laws of physics. Until now, we haven't been able to do that. And now with Turing, we can do that for the very first time, opening us up to this whole new world of interactive ray tracing and making it possible for us to, to bring acceleration to a marketplace that so long until today has relied on CPUs. And then lastly, Turing also opens up the ability for us to not only use our processors for deep learning, but also using it uh, deep learning training, but also using it for inference. Okay, three brand new markets. First, let's talk about graphics. You guys have seen some of the work that we've done here. We're going to fuse deep learning, artificial intelligence, and computer graphics together for the very first time. We're going to generate some of the pixels computationally using programmable shaders. And then we're going to use AI to infer some of the pixels so that we could either make it more beautiful generate pixels that otherwise couldn't be generated, or to generate those pixels much, much more quickly. 
We have 14 trillion operations per second of programmable shading, but we have 114 teraflops of deep learning. If we can create a neural network architecture and an AI that can infer and to imagine certain types of pixels, we could run that on our 114 teraflops of tensor core and run at a speed of light. And as a result, increase performance while generating beautiful images. I show you here some of the examples of some of the work that's been done recently at UC Berkeley to colorize Muhammad Ali, to teach a neural network how to colorize. This is work that's done at Pixar and Disney Research. It's called denoising, where ray tracing generates some of the pixels, and then using AI, it generates the rest of them. This is an artificial intelligence network we call super res, not scaling, but super resolution, which basically means generating pixels that didn't exist. So your original video track could be at 1080p, and using AI, we can generate new pixels, learning from all of the videos of the past, generate a 4K video, up resolution, super res comp otherwise known as computational super resolution. And then on top, in painting. We could teach a neural network to fill in the dots. Just as you could look at the photograph on the left and notice on the white, there are some pixels missing. You can probably figure out what is in there based on what's in the rest of the scene. And notice the artificial intelligence network redraws that building and it looks pretty amazing. It's much, much more powerful than just filtering. It's using artificial intelligence to generate the images. Well, we've done so. We're touring with computer graphics games. And we call it DLSS, where we generate, compute some of the shading, uh, rendering of some of the pixels, and we use AI to imagine some of them. As a result, the combination of our 114 teraflops tensor core with our 14 teraflops programmable shader we're able to deliver incredible results. This is 4K rendering on our Turing GPU using this new artificial intelligence neural network called DLSS, Deep Learning Super Sampling, and comparing it to the previous generation Pascal, look at the results. The 2070, 2070 is our current low-end Turing 2080 is our mid-range, and 2080 Ti is our high end. And comparing that to the last generation Titan XP, which is the king of GPUs at the time, $1,200, 2070 is higher performance. In each and every series, the Turing GPU is twice the performance of the Pascal version. This is a brand new way of doing computer graphics. We're so excited about it. It merges together computer graphics, traditional computer graphics, and deep learning into one cohesive pipeline. And the two of them work together using these two processors, one of them 14 teraflops, the other one 114, working together to deliver unbelievable results. Well, let's take a look at, um, so that's the first thing, which is Turing using AI and computer graphics working together for the future of computer graphics reinventing computer graphics. The second thing I talked about was ray tracing. Ray tracing is hard to talk about, but easy to show. Let me show you what ray tracing looks like. In, our next, in the next, next footage I'm about to show you, we're celebrating Porsche's 70, 70 year, uh, 70th birthday. The Porsche has been around for 70 years, a storied brand and uh, I'm so delighted to show you this footage. Hey, let's play it. The speed of light, a universal constant, never diminishing, never ending. Wow. 
Ladies and gentlemen, that is not a video. This is all being rendered in real time. Hey, Sean, why don't we flip it around here? Let's show sure. them what we can do. Look at that. The part, the part that is so amazing, the part that's so amazing is it looks so real, it looks like a video. In fact, every single time I show real-time computer graphics now, I have to remind people it's not a video because it's photorealistic. What's happening here is that every single light source is being traced through that scene and it bounces off the surface of the car. And the car material, the car paint, is modeled physically based, meaning it obeys the laws of physics. It obeys the laws of physics. We capture the material using simulations and measurements, and then after that, when it's rendered, it's physically based so that the energy that goes into the scene is conserved. The amount of light energy and the light energy that ultimately emitted is conserved. It obeys the laws of physics. And so, wow, that looks great. Did you, did you uh, rotate everything while I was talking, Sean? Uh, no, just a little bit. Okay. But we can see, you know, I'm just freely moving the camera around, and, and because it's entirely in real time, everything simply works. Shadows are beautiful. We can change uh, materials and lights. And again, it, it's all just completely reactive. It's incredibly easy to compose for artists. All they have to do is put the light sources in, put the geometry in, apply the surface, and then the rest of it does it by itself. It's basically a simulation of light physics. And as a result, everything looks beautiful and right. And that's why it looks like a photograph, it looks like a video. Okay, Sean, thank you very much. This happens to be the end of Oktoberfest <laughs> and the last day of Space Week. 60 years ago, Sputnik went to space. 50 years ago, 50 years ago, Apollo 11 went to space. And as you know, the movie First Man is coming out. And you know that during its time, during this time, there's been a controversy about the Apollo 11. Did we actually go to the moon? Did we actually go to the moon? I am certain that Ryan Gosling didn't go to the moon. However, let's, <clears throat> can you guys, uh, let's show them the image. The, so this is Apollo 11. The question is, did we go to the moon? And the reason for that, the reason why it was such a controversy is because Neil Armstrong is taking a picture of Buzz Aldrin as he's coming out of the limb 50 years ago. And because Buzz Aldrin is in shadow, Neil Armstrong is in sunlight, it's impossible for Buzz Aldrin to have been lit. That was the first source of the controversy. How was it possible that with, the, with Buzz in shadow, that he is so well lit? Well, uh, Brian, let's, let's move the sun around. Let's show, let's show them the reason why. Okay, so let's move the sun around. Let's move it all the, way around, all the way around. Now the sun is behind Buzz. As you can see, the shadow is now on the other side of the Apollo 11 lamb. And this, this would be highly believable. In fact, if this was the picture, the controversy would have never started. Neil simply took the picture from the wrong place, and he gave it away. He gave it away. Clearly, this was a con controversy. Let's put the sun back to where it was, where Neil had taken the picture. Now, the world believes, based on light physics, this is the way it should look. <laughs> and it makes sense. In fact, we're simply applying computer graphics right now. All of this is being simulated with computer graphics. In fact, the people who wrote the book about the controversy, the conspiracy, was right. On first principles, why should Buzz Aldrin have been lit? And the reason why they didn't realize this is this. It turns out the lunar surface is filled with a bunch of, it's covered by really fine particles. And these fine particles, because they reflect light from all these different angles, more of it, because they're oriented in a whole lot of different ways, it's more reflective 
than otherwise. This reflection made the lunar surface reflect light from the ground. So the ground is actually a light emission surface. And so all we have to do now is to apply two techniques. The first thing that we have to do is we have to apply reflection and reflect reflectance property on the surface of the moon. The second thing that we have to do is apply a technology called global illumination. The light from the sun, the light from the sun will bounce off the surface of the moon and it would scatter and, ref and emit, become a light emission source back to everything around it. We simply have to trace light bouncing all over the surface of the moon. And if we do so, we would have realized that in fact, Buzz Aldrin would have been lit. This simply applies global, global illumination. And so this is the benefit of NVIDIA RTX. Using this type of rendering technology, we could simulate life physics and things are gonna look the way that things should look. There's a, okay. Now, Brian, what else are you gonna show them? I can move the sun at the same time. <laughs> All right, you're having too much fun. Okay, thank you very much. We proved. I don't, I, don't know that, I don't know that we proved that the Apollo 11 crew went to the moon, but we proved that in fact the conspiracy theory, the principles were not right, that the moon does emit light, reflects light so well that it should light the scene. Okay, so the first thing is um, ray tracing. We reinvented computer graphics, merging traditional computer graphics with AI, and as a result, we can generate images that otherwise we couldn't before. And because we have this 114 teraflops processor, we could do it so fast that we could actually run scenes faster than they were possible before. As a result, Turing is twice the performance of Pascal. The second thing is ray tracing. Ray tracing is now done so fast that we could do it interactively. We could do it interactively, we're gonna add it into new games, and as new games come out throughout the year, more and more of them will incorporate NVIDIA's RTX technology. We also opened up a brand new market for ourselves as a result of RTX now being able to render photorealistic images much, much faster than CPUs are able to before. This important market that I'm gonna talk about next is the running of artificial intelligence in a hyperscale environment. We created the T4. Hey, Paul, can I borrow that real quick? So this is, oh, hey, could I borrow the RTX as well? Sorry, we're, we're still rehearsing. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, this is, this is the uh, state of the art in computer graphics. Ten, 10 years in the making of real-time ray tracing, a brand new way of doing computer graphics. We're gonna reinvent how computer graphics looks. And so in the future, when you see real-time computer graphics and it brings you a lot of joy, you know where you saw it first, right here. Okay, when you see these new computer graphic scenes, you go, oh, that looks so beautiful. That looks so real. That's right, I did it for you. Our first mission is to bring joy to you and your family. All right, the second, second, so here's a, thank you, Paul. Paul, stay here. I meant stay here, I didn't mean stay. <laughs> this, ladies and gentlemen, is a next generation accelerator for hyperscale deep learning. It's a universal deep learning accelerator. It trains, it infers. Whereas this particular machine is about high density deep learning, this machine, this little machine here, fits into hyperscale servers all over the world and allows us to scale it out. Allows us to scale it out. Compared to Pascal, look at the performance. 
It's incredible. It's the world's first multi-precision tensor core accelerator. Multi-precision meaning that it could compute either an FP32, FP16, 32-bit integer, 8-bit integer, and even 4-bit integer. Now, the reason for that is because neural networks is a statistical computational approach. Different layers of the neural network doesn't have to be as accurate as the others. And so whenever we can, we want to reduce precision. Whenever we must, we'll retain the precision. And so we can run a neural network in any of the necessary precisions so that we could achieve the highest level of accuracy with the highest throughput possible. If you look at computation on a Pascal, look at that. Computation, 5.5 trillion operations for 32-bit floating point, and 22 trillion operations for 8-bit energy. And yet, for T, uh, T4, which is Turing, 260 trillion operations per second. And so, on the one hand, we can have as much accuracy as anything we've ever done before. On the other hand, our throughput could be absolutely incredible. And the results are incredible. The results are, if you compare that, look at that. So in 2016 is Pascal. 2016 is Pascal. In literally three years' time, in literally three years' time, we've increased performance of ResNet 50, which is kind of the typical benchmark of an image recognition neural network, 50 layers deep, extremely complicated. In three years' time, we increased the performance by 10x. If it's three years, 10x, that's 1,000 times every 10 years. We're right on track. We're right on track for the new accelerated model, the new acceleration law. Someday, somebody's going to give it a name. A thousand X every 10 years. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I would offer a name, but you know. False modesty, let me just, go ahead, if somebody offers it, I'll, I'll you know. Okay, 1,000x every 10 years, accelerated computing. Now, the thing that's, that makes this really special, though, the, the thing that really makes it special, this, so this has the ability, if you could train it on NVIDIA's GPUs, and the vast majority of today's neural networks are trained on NVIDIA GPUs, you can surely run it on NVIDIA's GPUs. Just as you developed on x86, it will surely run on x86. If you developed on NVIDIA's neural network platform, you will surely be able to run any of them. There are so many species of them, thousands of them. There's all kinds, CNNs and RNNs and LSTMs. There's GANs, there are all kinds of stuff, reinforcement learning algorithms. There are all kinds of stuff, so many different species. And we know that if you develop it on NVIDIA, it should run on NVIDIA. We also know that performance has to be great because data center throughput has everything to do with cost. However, it turns out that the data center has so many different applications running at the same time, it's much, much more than just an accelerator challenge. It's also a computer system architecture challenge. So the very first time, our GPUs can run multiple models at the same time. And all of those models could be running in different precisions. And what's on top of it is this complicated set of new software. The baseline of it, it has to be containerized. Today's hyperscale data centers has everything cont in containers. Basically, super lightweight, bare metal virtualization. The second part of it is Kubernetes. NVIDIA now has excellent integration into Docker. NVIDIA has excellent integration into Kubernetes. All of it is NVIDIA GPU, CUDA aware, fully accelerated stacks. On top of that, we created the ability for us to run multiple models, as I mentioned, at the same time. And the most important part is this. To have this new type of system software we call the TRT, the Tensor RT Inference Server, that works with Kubernetes on a very large scale data center to report to Kubernetes, to let Kubernetes know. Kubernetes, as you know, is a or hyperscale orchestration software. It makes it possible for a sea of servers to run a whole bunch of different applications and for basically one large piece of software to figure out where the application should be run 
and where to put and move applications to orchestrate the workload of a data center. To orchestrate the workload of a data center, like an operating system, orchestrates the work of a PC, except this is over the course of 10 million processors. Enormous number of computers. Computers and memory and storage and networking. It's got Kubernetes orchestrates that entire thing for a hyperscale data center. Now, there are all kinds of different neural network applications coming in, and so the question is where to put it. Well, we created this entire stack on top of our GPU that can now handle multiple networks from multiple frameworks at the same time. We connect with Kubernetes, and we collaborate with this Kubernetes infrastructure to receive work, to receive work, and to run it, okay? As a result, as a result, you no longer need to have one GPU run just one model for one framework in one rack. Now the benefit of that is incredible amounts of improved throughput and capacity utilization. Let's show it to you. Hey Ryan, let's show it to him. So this is before. Uh, so uh, running with TensorRT inference server off. So this is the, the case in which we have one model running on just one GPU. OK, so, so give me one second, Ryan. Sorry sure. about that. Last year, we showed you guys flowers. We showed you, we, show you, we showed you the ability for a neural network to look at an image of a flower and recognize what it is. That's a miracle in itself. I think to be able to look at a whole bunch of ones and zeros that represents a flower, a picture of a flower, and to know what species of flower it is, is just a miracle. And so we were able to do that very, very fast. And we still do it incredibly fast. We do it faster today than we did it last time. Well, what we're showing you now is imagine a data center with eight servers inside. These are eight racks, eight pods. And each one of these, these pods, each one of the pods are running different neural network models. So this is running, 100% of this pod is running a flower neural network. And 100% of this pod is running a voice recognition network. 100% of this pod is running a product recommender. 100% of this pod is running a speech synthesis network. Okay? This shows the utilization of the pod, of that pod, of each one of these pods. And if you look at up there, the gray line, the gray line is the output, the throughput, the aggregate throughput of this data center. The aggregate throughput of this data center right now is running about 2,000 units of work. Well, it's less than that, I guess. Is it 2,000? Yeah, about 2,000 units of work. We are, rec we are demanding 1,200 of units of work of, the of flowers, which all has to run on pod one and pod two, pod one and pod two, okay? So with that background, Ryan? Yeah, uh, so what happens is now, if the flowers gets really popular and we have more load, let's just increase the load. And as you could see, that flower workload, flowers is starting to load up on these two pods because these two pods are designated to run flowers. Okay, designated to run this type of neural network. And so as you can see, these two pods are fairly loaded. And the work, work demand, the blue line has, the work throughput of, of uh, flowers has gone up, and the aggregate has gone up. And well, what, what the demand notice? is 5,000, and we're delivering about 4,000, and we're running about 90% utilization on those two pods. Yeah, so we can't quite meet our demand, right? So let's turn TensorRT server on. OK. What happened? All right, so did you guys just notice what happened? So what happened was this, the first two pods, which before, each one of the pods were designated to run certain applications, certain models. Now all of a sudden, every single pod can run any model. With TensorRT inference server running in Kubernetes, any one of these pods can run any model. As a result, the utilization of all of them comes down. The utilization of all of them comes down, okay? Nothing has really changed that much. But here's the beautiful thing. 
Okay, go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, so we have all this extra capacity in our data center, so we can take, make use of that now as well. And one thing we have to do is we have to scale that access up. Wow. All right. So, so let me see if I understand what just happened. What just happened is we have all these GPU accelerated servers. And they're running incredibly fast, hundreds of times faster than CPUs. Hundreds of times faster than CPUs. But they're single tasking. So we put one type of model of one framework in one pod. We take another type of model, we run another, another pod, but the world's demand is coming all the time. And so there's no way to meter out, exact, figure out exactly how much demand is gonna come from what kind of models or what kind of applications and what kind of queries a customer may have at any given point in time. And so it's impossible to allocate the right model to the right servers. And so that's the reason why computers are multitasking. In our particular case, we've now essentially made multitasking, but also multi-model, and also multi-framework on one GPU. As a result of that, Kubernetes can now figure out where available capacity is in the data center, independent of what workload comes in, so long as these deep neural networks, put it on top of one of these servers, and it just screams. It just screams. So, Ryan, the bottom line is this. Okay, this is the beauty. You know that the benefit of GPUs is the more you buy, uh, the more you, you save. <laughs> right? Okay. With our brand new Tensor RT inference server. You don't have to buy anything. You could save all kinds of money. So this is a scary prospect. This is a scary product for us. But I'm, I'm just so delighted to, to make it available. The fact of the matter is a data center, a data center should be multifunction. And for, the, and, and, and for, for general purpose code, it is. For general purpose code, it is. For the very first time, we're now able to turn a hyperscale data center, a data center, into a multi-function, multi-application, deep learning computer. That's what's such a big deal about this. Okay, so this is the future of computing. Good job, Ryan. Okay, so, so the first chapter, first chapter of my talk, Turing, a revolutionary GPU. A giant leap forward, a giant leap, a giant leap. Small step for mankind, but a giant leap for Apollo 11. A giant leap, a giant leap. And this is the first GPU in our history that not only redefined computer graphics, realized a dream, a 30-year dream of making real-time ray tracing, fusing artificial intelligence and computer graphics at the same time redefining computer graphics, opens up the world of rendering, photorealistic rendering, finally to acceleration. At the end of Moore's Law, filmmakers are under just as much pressure as anybody else for acceleration. Finally, with Turing, we can accelerate film rendering. And then lastly, a universal GPU for deep learning, which turns your data center into a general purpose computer for deep learning. Super exciting. Three new markets as a result of Turing. High performance computing. As I mentioned earlier, high performance computing, supercomputing, is one of the most essential instruments of science. Without, it, high, without high performance computing, very few fields of science could be possible today. Whether it's the Nobel Prize or the Golden Bell Bright Prize winners, all of them were made possible as a result of high performance computing. In 2005, this industry, this market, was largely scientific computing, and it represented about $10 billion. We came into this marketplace with the invention of CUDA around 2006. As a result of that, as a result of that, all of the things that we talked about earlier happened. This year, 
this year, 54% of the new computing flops of supercomputing was contributed by one processor, the V100, the Tesla V100. Five out of the world top seven supercomputers are now GPU accelerated. This year, five out of the six Golden, Gordon Bell Prize winners for groundbreaking science was made possible by NVIDIA GPUs. Last year's two Nobel Prize winners, both of them for physics and chemistry, made possible as a result of GPU acceleration. Here in Europe, CERN, the 17-mile Hadron Collider, proton, high-energy proton beams zipping around in both directions, colliding at just a hair off the speed of light. Those high-energy proton beams are flying at three meters per second short of the speed of light. They collide. All kinds of stuff happens. Shrapnel happens when pro protons collide. And the decay time is so fast that unless you catch it, it's gone. And so the amount of data they generate is actually torrential. torrential. 200 petabytes of data that they generated last year alone. And that, that 200 petabytes per second, 200 petabytes of data, only captures approximately 0%. Approximately 0% of the data that's actually collected. 0.0003% is 0 to 0%. 0 200 petabytes, and that's basically storing absolutely nothing. And so the question, the question is, what did they miss? You've got to ask, what did they miss? Now, of course, they focused on, they used all kinds of very smart algorithms to figure out what to store, but the fact of the matter is they would like to be able to compute faster, be able to predict what to, what to go store faster, and to analyze um, the collision a lot more quickly. So in the next build of the uh, supercomputing center, it's going to be GPU accelerated. CSCS, Switzerland, is now building a supercomputer to simulate weather at one kilometer square. T today it's a 12 kilometer square. 12 kilometer square doesn't allow you to, to account for clouds, which as you know, obscure sunlight, which affects weather. At one kilometer square, they need about 2,000 times more computational horsepower. GPUs are gonna make that possible. DFKI here in Germany, to use high resolution satellite images to detect and warn people of natural disasters in real time. Combining that with social media information, all the images and videos that are coming online, to composite it all together into one holistic image, reconstruct it into one holistic image, to be able to detect natural disasters. Technico Lisboa. They're trying to figure out how to understand the insides of a fusion reactor, because apparently, any small disturbance would cause a fusion reactor to have to shut down. And at this moment, fusion reactors only run for a few seconds at a time because there's always disturbances somewhere in the environment. And so they want to understand that using deep learning and computational sciences for the very first time to understand the inner workings of a fusion reactor. So much great science being done on GPUs. This is the most rewarding work that we do as a company, to create the tool, the computing platform, by which scientists could discover new knowledge. Well, meanwhile, while this was all happening, an event happened around the same time. About the 2006 time frame, something happened and very few people paid attention to it. Hadoop became open sourced, NumPy was open sourced, Scikit-Learn was open sourced, Pandas was open sourced around that time. These four pieces of software, which seems unrelated, turned out to have been the foundations for this new approach of computing, this new approach of writing software called machine learning. Whereas deep learning, whereas deep learning is a neural network that figures out what the important features, what important features to learn in order to composite a pattern. So look, for example, a deep learning network will look at a whole bunch of pictures of a human and notice that a human is ears, eyes, nose, mouth, arms, legs. And that a tree 
has different limbs, maybe no eyes and ear and mouth. And by studying a whole bunch of images, it figures out what's a human and what's a tree with no initial determination of what are the important defining features. Machine learning is different. Machine learning uses domain experts to figure out what the features are. A domain expert would say, you know what, I know exactly what a human looks like. A human has ears and eyes and nose. And so I'm going to go detect a whole bunch of images. I'm going to look at a whole bunch of images. And when I see the combination of ears, eyes, and nose, that's a human face. OK? And so machine learning, as you could see, just took off. Because in so many different domains, whether it's in retail, insurance, financial services, healthcare, the domain experts know what features they want to look for. And now that they figure out what the features are, they apply machine learning, studying from a whole bunch of data to do classification, which is basically detection, or regression, which is prediction, clustering, segmentation, using all kinds of new algorithms. And these new algorithms are things like gradient-boosted decision trees, random forests, k-nearest neighbor for classification and regression, k-mean for clustering. All these different type of neural network, or excuse me, machine learning algorithms, decision tree algorithms, and graph analytics in order to go and predict, ultimately learn how to predict from a whole bunch of data that it was given. Well, this whole machine learning industry quietly took off, and in fact, it surrounds us today. We now take it for granted. The fact of the matter is we talk to computers on a regular basis to ask for directions, ask for recommendations. If not for machine learning, we would have a very hard time sorting through the several thousand movies and TV shows on Netflix. Four out of five TV four out of five shows that we watch on Netflix are recommended by an AI. A third of the purchases we make were recommended on Amazon. It says a third of the purchases you wouldn't have done anyways. Think about that. A third of your purchases you wouldn't have made. But an AI says, you know what, you gotta consider this. And you know what you do, you click OK. <laughs> you say, buy now. OK, a third of the time. I don't know how many trillion dollars that is. A third of the time. And if not for AI, American Express wouldn't be able to look at their one trillion dollars of transactions each year. One trillion dollars of transactions each year and detect fraud, credit card fraud. It's happening in real time. And so these things simply can't be possible without machine learning. Retail uses it for inventory management, and price optimization. Healthcare now uses it to predict whether you would have a side effect of certain drugs, um, claim frauds. Financial services use it for you know, portfolio management, risk portfolio, for figuring out whether there's, there's a, a fraud uh, and such. Okay, So uh, these industries are gigantic. And if they can improve their performance, their financial results, or their customer satisfaction by even a fraction of a percentage, the impact to their bottom line is absolutely enormous. And that's the reason why companies have become data driven. These companies are essentially an autonomous machine with sensors coming in from the internet or clicks or Twitter or smart microphones or all these different sensors are coming in this torrential amounts of data are going into the data scientist group. The data scientist group are using it to figure out what kind of machine learning algorithm they can create. And from that machine learning algorithm, they could then predict, they could detect things that are going on in the environment or in the marketplace in real time and take the necessary, make the necessary recommendations for the company to take action on. Incredible new companies. The most leading edge companies are data driven and everybody wants to be data driven now because you want to be competitive and just so much data is available. What well, it all started out with, as I mentioned, these four software packages. Python with Grio Van Rossen is a, a, a relatively easy to use computer language. It is uh, interpreted. One of its features is that it's easy to read. And, then also, and, and as a result, data scientists and researchers and scientists all over the world start to use it. 
Python is basically the language of researchers today. It's essentially, you know, instead of MATLAB, almost everybody uses Python. NumPy is a math library for arrays and multidimensional computation. NumPy was created by Travis Oliphant. And then Pandas, Wes McKinney, I think, is in the audience, 2008. Wes McKinney wrote a library called Pandas that allows you to manipulate data, multidimensional data, taking in large amounts of data sets and turning it into a data frame that you can then ultimately use for machine learning. Pandas is used by data scientists all over the world, millions of them. Pandas is absolutely everywhere. And Enria, in France, created an open source library for, uh, for machine learning called Sidekick Learn. So the algorithms I talked about, where there's boosted decision trees, or random forest, or uh, k-nearest neighbor, or k-means, or clustering algorithms, db scan, all in this library. All open source, easy to use. These four packages in combination ignited the machine learning revolution. It made it possible for every company, every company, to be able to do machine learning, which is the foundation of every internet company we know today. If it wasn't because of machine learning, Google wouldn't have been founded. Yahoo wouldn't have been founded. These companies would not have been possible. Netflix wouldn't be possible without machine learning. And now, because of these open source packages, the capabilities that revolutionized the internet is now in the hands of every large company. The data science revolution took off. The question is why did it take us so long to get into this space? Everybody asked, you know, why haven't you been able to help machine learning? And the reason for that is because, of course, machine, the reason is because Moore's law has ended, the amount of data that computing is so large, data scientists suffer extraordinarily, as we will show you in just a moment. You know, people tell me that this is the most desirable job in the world, and, and the reason for that is because, as, as I'll illustrate to you in just a second, it's mostly about drinking coffee. You're waiting all the time. That's why it's such a great job. Everybody wants to do it. Who doesn't? What are you doing today, honey? I'm going to a coffee shop, doing my job. Okay, I'll show you in just a second why. But we've been trying to figure out how to accelerate machine learning for a long time. It's just that the infrastructure made it impossible to. Today's package, based around those four software, open source software, is basically single threaded. It was developed on CPUs, it runs great on CPUs, but it just simply doesn't scale. And then also, one day, something happened. Matthew Rockland at Anaconda created this paralyzing software infrastructure platform called Dask. It made it possible for us to paralyze, paralyze Python applications across multiple nodes. That was the first piece of the puzzle, the first piece of the puzzle. 2016, 2016, Wes, um, um, Matthew uh, Rockland uh, made it possible for us to, to even consider it. And then here comes the second piece of the puzzle. The second piece of the puzzle is just completely revolutionary. The second piece of the puzzle was created by Wes McKinney. As I mentioned earlier, he was the, he was the author um, of a creator of Pandas and, and wrote several books on it. And uh, he, he's really fun to watch on YouTube. And, and if you're a data scientist, I'm sure you already use, it, use Pandas. And so the second piece of the puzzle is when he realized that machine learning was reaching its limit and that data scientists need a way to accelerate their work, he created Aero. What Aero is, it's a multi-language in-memory data format. It's a multi-language in-memory data format. There are so many different applications out there, and every one of them are operating on memory, and each one of their memory formats are different. So the first thing that he did was created basically a standard where he unified everybody's, everybody's tools around one data format. And that data format is in memory. It operates not on disk, it operates in memory. If it operates in memory, it has the chance to be fast. But there are two other things that he did on Arrow that was incredibly vital. First, it's columnar. Instead of reading by rows, you read by columns so that all of the data format remains the same as you're striping through it reading through it. The, sec the second thing that he did was vectorizing it. 
The operations of this data format, this framework, is vectorized. Vectorized basically means it's going to be perfect for GPUs so that we can access a whole bunch of data all at one time of the same data type, and we can just scream through the data. And then lastly, to make it multi-language, we now have the ability in memory to be able to just pass pointers from one application to another, point, another, another application without having to copy the results of one application as the input of another application, we can now use zero copy IPC, inter process communications. Basically, don't pass the data, just pass where the data is. With that simple communications, we have now created that sim those characteristics, we have created the foundations for what is possible now, we call accelerated machine learning. On top of it, when that, form, when that foundation was laid and Dask was available, between Dask and Arrow, it created the conditions by which we can accelerate machine learning. And we poured a CUDA, and we created two open source libraries. One open source library is called CUDF, CUDA Data Frame. Data Frame is basically, um, CUDF is pandas-like. It's not pandas compatible, but it's pandas-like. If you've written pandas, a pandas program in Python, uh, it's easy peasy. And you'll just, you have to, you have to rewrite some parts, um, but it looks exactly the same. The second part, the second thing we did was created Qsicle for CUDA scikit-learn. And it is, again, it's not compatible because it can't be, but it is like. So you recognize the libraries, you recognize the calls, you recognize all the APIs, and so if you've written a, Psychic, you've written a Python program that uses Psychic Learn, it's going to be a small rewrite, and now, with just a small rewrite, you've taken your Pandas program, and you've ported it to, rewritten it for QDF, you've taken your program that, for machine learning, and you rewrote it for QML, and now both of them are accelerated with NVIDIA GPUs. This is such a huge deal. This is such an enormous deal, and I'm going to show you that in just a second. But here's the, here's the wonderful thing. We know that people start with machine learning because they have, it's an easy on-ramp to machine learning. It's an easy on-ramp to AI. The, the domain experts could figure out what the features are. It could start collecting a whole bunch of data, but once you have a torrent of data, it would be fantastic to now take it to the next level of accuracy using deep learning. And so what we did was, extended this entire platform for data science to go from data frame manipulation to machine learning to deep learning in one memory. In one memory. What do you guys think about that? So for the data scientists, engineers in the room, you guys are going, wow, this is amazing. For everybody else, you're going, those are beautiful green boxes. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. One of the most, and so Pandas and Scikit-Learn, Python, NumPy, it forms the foundation of the most popular machine learning, popular data science platform in the world. Millions and millions of data scientists use it. It is the first stop. However, for large-scale data learning, for large-scale large data analytics and, and data science and machine learning, it's Spark. This was created as the brainchild of Mate Zaharia. Mate Zaharia was at UC Berkeley at the time. He's now the CTO of Databricks. He created Spark, him and his team. Spark is basically a distributed cluster-scale end-to-end system as I described earlier, except this is running on Java. And so Spark has a large install base, tens of millions, tens of millions of nodes around the world in the, the large industries that I just talked about. Use Spark today to do data science and data analytics and machine learning at scale. They're running it in large data centers. They're feeding in torrents and torrents of data, petabytes and petabytes of data. Their data scientists are sitting here crunching through all the data, figuring out, you know, figuring out how to, to, to uh, 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 do feature engineering and then 
uh, do the machine learning and then deploying it and, and then going back and forth and just continuously refining the machine learning models. And as a result, the company is able to predict customer behavior, figure out what's going on in, in the supply chain, figure out how much of new inventory they want to build, et cetera, et cetera. Well, this Spark ecosystem and the Python ecosystem has largely been separate until now. Because of the work of Wes McKinney and Arrow, these two worlds can now be linked. Spark is now on Arrow. And now with Rapids, which is the name that we call our open source platform for accelerated machine learning, accelerated data science, between Arrow and Rapids, these two worlds can now go back and forth. Really, really exciting. And so uh, currently Rap uh, Spark is uh, version 2.3 by version 2.4. We're going to incorporate a whole bunch of the accelerating stack of Rapids into Spark. And these two uh, systems will be able to uh, communicate with each other. And then long term, we'll make it one. OK? So Spark is the last piece of the puzzle. Now, with all of that, we have integrated Rapids into basically the world's data science ecosystem. And companies, big and small, Researchers, new and experienced, could get into machine learning using Rapids and be able to accelerate it and do it quickly. And if they want to take it as a way to get into deep learning, they can also do so. Rapids runs on cross, as you know, all because it's running on CUDA, it runs on every GPU we have. And so we have now GPU sizes, memory sizes of 32 gigabytes all the way up to a brand new computer called DGX2, which is 512 gigabytes. 512 gigabytes. It's, a, it's one GPU with half a terabyte of data. Now, one of the things that you know about data science is it's about big data. And so big data needs big memory. And big memory is not one of the things that GPUs are known for. GPUs are known for fast memory. And so we invented this thing called MVLink. And MVLink has the same protocol as inside the GPU. So the memory references of one GPU accessing the memory of another GPU looks like theirs. OK, so all the memories connected to MVLink, all the GPUs connect, connected to MVLink, basically could see all of the other GPUs' memory as theirs. Well, that's how we are able to turn very, very fast memory, which is a characteristic of GPUs, into gigantic memory, which is a characteristic of slow computers of the past, CPUs. And so enterprise scale data science. Let me show you kind of what MVLink looks like. Hey, Paul, you still back there? Yeah, sure, you were taking a break. I saw him. He was napping back there. OK, guys, this is what MVLink looks like, OK? It's super light. It's only 150 pounds. <laughs> I've done this before, so I'm rather strong. OK, so, so this is a, th oh my gosh, OK. That's $100,000 right there, so let's not drop it. And so eight V100 GPUs, all connected with MV links, which are right here. And then it comes out of the back of the, of the motherboard, which connects to a backplane of MV links, which goes into another motherboard. And as a result, 16 of these GPUs connect together into one gigantic GPU. OK? All right? And so here, let me show it to you. All right. Let me do this left-handed. All right, so you see that? I'm holding on to the top, cha the top part of that chassis. It's super heavy. It's super heavy. Each one of these GPUs has one terabytes per second. One terabytes per second. So you know a server has several hundred, call it 300 gigabytes per second. Three, 0 0.3 terabytes per second. 0 0.3 terabytes per second of memory bandwidth. We've created a computer with 16 GPUs connected to memory at 16 terabytes per second. 50 times the bandwidth, 50 times the bandwidth of a server. And the memory, the memory capacity, the memory footprint of a server. Does that make sense? This, ladies and gentlemen, is a DGX2. Oh, God. This is very heavy. 
There you go. <laughs> Broke out in a sweat. All right. So, everything here from the GPU architecture to the interconnect, the CERTES, the system board, the computer, the system software, all of the acceleration stacks that I just talked to you about, all created from the ground up, as I mentioned, for one domain of applications, data analytics and machine learning. All from the ground up. And so the question is, what's the benefit? Why did we do such a thing? Why did we look at this incredible sized domain called machine learning? It is the largest HPC market today, the largest segment of HPC that is completely unaccelerated. We've been wanting to do this for a long, long time. In order to do so, in order to do so, we had to wait and work with some really influential leaders in the, in the, in the machine learning and data science industry and created a stack and then create a computer from the ground up. And so let's take a look at what it can do. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Josh Patterson. He's going he's to talk us through this demo. And, um, and here, go ahead, Josh. Thanks, Jensen. So I first wanted to show a little sample of the data of what we're working with. So we loaded um, a few rows of data into pandas. Uh, and this is the data from Fannie Mae. It's all the data from 2000 to 2016. And it's mortgage data. And so you can see who sold the loan, uh, what was the original interest rate, uh, what was the original date of the loan, um, number of borrowers, debt to income, uh, that's the DTI variable. Uh, and so there's just a lot of characteristics about the data. And then we have the performance data as well. So how people paid the loan each month, um, if the loan went into 30 day or 60 day or 90 day delinquency, et cetera. And so uh, when you switched over to the DGX slide, I went ahead and kicked off this job. And to process about one quarter of data uh, in Pandas is around uh, two minutes. Oh, and so by the way, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just keep letting Pandas run uh, through, the, uh, through the quarters of the data uh, while we progress. And then I'm gonna switch over to this other notebook that I kicked off. And it's the, uh, it's the same notebook essentially running on a DGX2. So we changed a few small things, um, but we're you know, doing just normal data science. Um, so joins, uh, group buys. Uh, here you can see where we, uh, we set the GPU uh, load performance CSV. So we're loading data from uh, CSV into the GPU memory directly. And we're just running through this notebook. And so the, the ETL part actually happened so quickly that uh, we didn't get to see that part on the screen. But it, it ran in about 37.9 uh, seconds. And so we processed all, two, uh, all data from 2000 to 2016 in about 40 seconds. Um, and so on the other side, Pandas is still running. Um, and that's what 16 V100s could do for us. That's okay, right. so, so guys, Josh is a world-class data scientist. He architected Rapids. And a whole bunch of computer scientists at NVIDIA worked together with the open science, open source data scientist industry to community to create Rapids, all right? So let me tell you what he said. <laughs> are you guys, are you guys, okay, all right. All right, let me tell you what he said. So the, at first, you've got basically 16 years of all of the mortgage data that Fannie Mae has, 16 years. 16 years, it's 400 gigabytes of data. 400 gigabytes of data. Let's, don't even try it, you're not gonna load that into Excel. <laughs> okay, 400 gigabytes of data. So, so you have 400, somebody back there going, I tried. <laughs> okay, that computer's hung for good. And so, so you have 400 gigabytes of data, it's in storage, right? The first thing we have to do is we have to stream it off of disk. And we stream it off of disk in parallel. We're streaming it in, we're decompressing it. There's a whole, there's a whole set of libraries called QIO that's doing this. It's streaming it into, directly into our memory, our GPU memory, half a terabytes of GPU memory. In that half a terabytes of GPU memory, our GPU is now gonna do this thing called ETL, 
Extract, transform, and load, okay? ETL, really sexy word. And so this ETL, what it does basically is this. It's gonna do things like, it's gonna take this two data sets. One data set is all of your mortgage history. 140 million different loans given. They know who you are. They know your credit history. They know how much you borrowed, okay? They know, and then they, they know everything about you. All these different columns are different features. These different columns are different features. They decided those are the necessary features to determine whether you're going to be a loan, a loan risk or not. Then second, they have another data set. This data set has a whole bunch of data in it for, per the rows that we talked about for every single, every single loan. And it has the history of your payments. And it, it, turn, it, it tracks whether you're delinquent or not. And it tracks your credit history over time. And so it collected all of that. Now, the first thing that we're going to do is we load both of these data sets into the computer and we join them. That's called join. And then the second thing we're going to do is we're going to figure out, we're going to figure out what are the characteristics that we want to train the machine learning on. And so what, 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 what Josh did was he said, you know what, I'm going to look at the previous year. And because, because they have 16 years of data, they know who defaulted. They know who defaulted and they know who paid early. That data exists. Isn't that right? So they know who defaulted, they know who paid early, and they go back 12 months. He went back 12 months, and he looked at the characteristics that led up to those 12 months. And he simply said, you defaulted, this is one. You didn't default, that's a zero. He takes, he, he adds ones and zeros, adds ones and zeros, which basically has this group by and the filter. He adds ones and zeros, and now that became a data frame that he's going to put into machine learning. So okay? The Step one, ingest the data. Step two, do this crazy thing called ETL. Step three, get ready to train the model. And he's going to train the model using this thing called XGBoost. It's a gradient-boosted decision tree. All right, so this machine learning model is gonna go train. Now, during the time that I was talking, did it do it? it? It's done training. Okay, so it's done training. So what just happened is this. In the time that we've been talking here, Josh took 16 years of all of Fannie Mae's data on, on mortgage loans. He loaded it into one computer, this one. Okay, he loaded it into one computer, all of Fannie Mae in here, all right? And then he processed it, did some crazy stuff to it, and then he trained this neural network to predict whether you're going to be a loan risk or not. Does that make sense? And so the next loan comes in, they're gonna watch you. Every, every time you either pay or didn't pay, they watch you, and then all of a sudden, a flag comes up. Jensen's a loan risk. Jensen's a loan risk. Jensen's a loan risk, you know why? because I'm gonna prepay the mortgage. And you know, if you're a lender, you'd like me to be a lender, a loan. You'd like to lend money to me. Okay, so, so Josh, Josh. Now, after we're done with that, then we visualize it. This is what a data scientist do, okay? And so red, oh, look at that. Hey, guess what? This machine's good at computer graphics. <laughs> Shocking, huh? <laughs> Whatever you want to do, however you want to do it, you want to put it in motion, you want to ray trace it, lickety split, okay? So we're going to be fantastic at that. And so there, there are all the states. Um, uh, San Francisco is over here. Uh, San Francisco is fantastic. Look at that. Blue is good. Uh, Florida, not so. Okay, Texas, hmm, questionable. Okay, San Francisco, pretty good. All right, ladies and gentlemen, machine learning at a gigantic scale. Josh Patterson, thank you. Now, all of you guys are thinking, wow, so what? I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, so what? Here, let me show you so what.
This is what it looks like. All right. This, guys, this is in seconds. This, by the way, is two hours. 72 sec 7,200 seconds is two hours. Okay? So this is two hours. Now, if you had that stack and you ran it on 20 CPU nodes, it would take you two hours to experience what we just experienced. If you just had one PC, 40 hours. So machine learning, data science engineers routinely go home as soon as they hit enter. <laughs> There's nothing else to do. You're going to talk to a few other data scientists, and you ask them, did you hit enter? And, and everybody said they hit enter. It's time to go. <laughs> this is the life of a data scientist. And so what they do is they call the IT department, they rack up this thing, 20 nodes, and they run Spark. OK? This is Mate's work. So Mate's work, he made it possible for us to scale it out into 20 CPUs. Even with 20 CPUs, it took two hours to do the ETL. Once you ingest it, to munge it, to join it, and to group by, to create the data frame for training, DGX2. I don't know what that is, but it's short. <laughs> then you've got to do machine learning. This is what it's all about. The first part is just preparing the data. Data prep, cleaning, feature engineering. This is the second part. This is ultimately the goal of machine learning scientists. DGX2. Not so long. Machine learning, XG boost on 20 CPUs, even 100 CPUs. And the reason for that is because machine learning, ultimately, they have to synchronize between nodes. And the overhead of synchronization becomes so high, there's just no way of getting it to go any faster. What you're experiencing, what you see there, is exactly the reason why deep learning has gone to GPUs. Because scaling out into multiple nodes of CPUs, or big, big science scale out, Model parallelism is simply not possible with large scale out. Even if you have a thousand CPUs, it won't make any difference. You're communicating with each other so much that nobody is spending any time doing the actual work. You put it on DGX2, where all the processors are really close by, they're connected to half a terabyte of memory at 16 terabytes per second, and it's doing two petaflops of computing, Lick lickety split. And this is the new world. This is the new world. This is the new world. Look at this. Look at this. With 100 CPUs, with a 100 CPU cluster, a whole rack, it would take an hour. And on DGX2, I would not get up and go get coffee. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. In fact, when we showed these numbers, when we created the, got this whole stack accelerated, one of our own data scientists made this home drawing. And he sent it to me. He goes, this is, the, this is the life of a data scientist. This is how we're going to change the life of a data scientist. I liked it so much, including all the misspellings. I'm going to share it with you guys. All right? This is from one of our data scientists. Look at this beautiful drawing and all the misspellings. You guys have to look cl closely. All right? So this is, this, is his, this is Alan. This is Alan's life before. And this is Alan's life after. I'm going to show it to you in just a second. This is just downloading data. Just downloading data. Their lives, they, a lot of waiting. So this is, this is green as the machine is processing. Red is when he's working, actually thinking, working. This is the part I should be paying him. This is the part I don't know who I should be paying. And so you see that? Now, that's before. This is after. Lots of reds. Lots of reds. He, Alan's working, not doing much waiting. Working, not doing much waiting. Now look at this. I love this part. You see, you see before? Lots of coffee cups. After? Pretty much he's weaned off of caffeine. You see that? Before and after. The thing I love about this one, the thing about, I love about his hand drawing, is that when he's waiting, it's green. When he's working, it's red. <laughs> Does that make any sense to you? <laughs> the 
way it should be, the way it should be, green should be when he's working, right? Okay, so, but the best part is, is, uh, is the punchline. If you're a data scientist before, you stay late. If you're a data scientist with NVIDIA, you go home. You got your work done. You got your work done. Okay, so before and after, that's the value proposition of Rapids running on DGX2. But you could run it on almost anything you want to run on. Okay, so from an IT manager, from an IT manager, it would take 300 servers, it would take 300 servers, if you're building out an infrastructure, it would take 300 servers at $3 million to keep up with one of these, okay? And so as you guys know, the more you buy, the more you save, okay? So this is, it's just, it's a wonderful equation. The wonderful equation of accelerated computing. Now, the reason why, the reason why the more you buy, the more you save is such a wonderful way of thinking about accelerated computing is this. We're accelerating things a thousand times in the domains we focus on. And when we accelerate something a thousand times over the course of 10 years, if your demand goes up by a hundred times, you just save 10 times. Okay, so that's the way to think about it. On the other hand, if your demand goes up by a thousand times, then your cost doesn't go up then your cost doesn't go up. <laughs> so the benefit of accelerated computing. We've been working with some really large companies. This is, our, this is the product, the first product our company has ever made that is for large industry. Up until now, we've been building GPUs for computer graphics engineers, video gamers, scientists, and now we're building products for the largest enterprise. And we decided to go to the largest company in the world to work with them on using Rapids. And their results are just fantastic. Here's the problem they wanted to solve. So it turns out there's an enormous amount of waste in the world's food supply chain. And the reason for that is because it's perishable. And if they don't forecast it right for every single store, for every single state, for every single region, for every single product, for every single produce, then it's wasted. $270 billion worth of food is wasted each year. Imagine all the people who are, who are dying of hunger struggling from hunger, here we are wasting a quarter of a trillion dollars of food each year. So imagine the benefits to the bottom line, imagine the benefits to customer service if they were able to predict more accurately exactly how much and how many bananas to put in exactly which store at exactly what time and what season. Well, as a result, this is a large data problem. And so they've been working on this, and the results for them was just amazing. They were scaling out into larger and larger clusters, I was explaining to you, and now, phew, in just a few GPUs, they could now accelerate their training and accelerate their prediction, and they believe they, they're going to save a whole bunch of money. This is a large enterprise product. It's going to go to large enterprises all over the world. What could be a better partner than one of the largest enterprise computing companies in the world working with us to bring Rapids and a whole family of GPU servers to large companies all around the world. The coverage of companies is enormous. The coverage of companies to, to go, who are using machine learning is enormous. And so I really appreciate the partnership with Antonio Neri and uh, his company, uh, HP Enterprises, to create a whole family of servers. We've had a long partnership with IBM. I mean, look at this. First company, Walmart. Second company, HP. Third company, IBM. All of the partners for Rapids start with open source community because of the incredible work that's done there to create the stack, and now to go to market the world's largest companies. IBM, we've been partners with them, collaborators on MVLink to create this multi-GPU connected to CPU, very high-scale computing server. We've had a partnership with IBM for very many years. And now IBM is taking Rapids and integrating it into their Watson Studio, Watson Machine Learning, and putting it into the cloud, running it on top of their power servers, and basically taking it into the world for machine learning and data science. Oracle, the largest database company in the world. More supply chains in the world run on Oracle than any other platform. And they're, they're going to take Rapids, integrate it into their machine learning system, and put it into their data science platform, and put it into the cloud. Incredible partners. I really, really appreciate 
their collaboration, and it just tells you how big of a challenge machine learning is. It tells you how big of a challenge data science is. They've been begging for acceleration, but until Arrow came along, DAS came along, and now Rapids, it just simply wasn't possible. And so all of the pieces are now together. Rapids accelerates the entire pipeline of data science, all the way from our smallest GPUs to DGX2. If you want to have half a terabyte in memory to compute against, we now have the entire data science pipeline fully accelerated. Okay, I want to thank all of our partners <coughs> for joining us. So this is, this is our machine, this is our HPC platform. This is an important slide. If there's one thing that you can remember today, remember this. We are bringing accelerated high-performance computing, and we're doing so now. We added two new stacks to our platform. We started with science, and I'm so pleased and so proud of the progress that we've made in advancing science. You know that we are everywhere in deep learning, particularly in training. We enabled deep learning to be democratized. We enabled deep learning to have ignited the modern AI revolution. We've now created a universal deep learning accelerator that can go into hyperscale and run and turn your hyperscale data center into a general purpose deep learning data center and a segment that has not been accelerated until now because of all the things I mentioned, big data for big industry, for big companies, and machine learning. These four stacks, these four stacks now represent our portfolio of acceleration. The computers range from single node dense computer, DGX2, all the way to sparse distributed computing in a hyperscale. Same stack, architecturally compatible. All of the software runs on both ends and inside a workstation or PC if you like. Okay, so this is NVIDIA's accelerated HPC platform. Let me change gears now and talk about the next chapter of AI. The next chapter of AI is when AI comes out of the cloud in the data center and comes into the world. And that is called autonomous machines. Autonomous machines requires an AI to sense the world, to sense the world, to perceive its environment, to reason about its environment, predict what everything else, all the other agents in the environment will do, and to take reasonable action that is along the lines of its goals. Okay? And so um, autonomous machines don't have, to be connect, don't have to be connected to the internet, and they should be able to operate by themselves. The computer for an autonomous machine, therefore, by definition, has never been built before because we've never seen such an autonomous machine before. And this computing stack is fundamentally different than the others. Whereas all of the others are best effort, this computing stack has to be real time. Whereas other computing stacks do things that could cause no harm, largely, for example, if they recommended an ad, you don't like it, just ignore it. However, an autonomous machine is interacting with the environment and so safety is paramount. Functional safety architecture is everything. Real-time computing is everything. We need to have the ability to process sensors in real time. And so we created Xavier, probably the most amazing chip we've ever created. It is years ahead of the next one that's going to likely be created, and the next one likely will be the next generation of Xavier. This processor has been just a gigantic investment on our part. It has seven different types of processors inside. It has image sensing processors for do, doing all kinds of image processing on what's, what the camera sees and warping and all kinds, of, um, all kinds of local computer graphics associated with it to prepare it for the next stage of motion detection, structure from motion, serial, uh, st serial disparity detection, optical flow, detecting how something is moving to deep learning, doing it in multiple kinds, doing CUDA, and then of course, very powerful microprocessors. We have eight CPU cores, ARM64 fully custom designed to be very high performance. All of this fits in one single chip and operates anywhere from 15 to 30 watts. And well, I guess it could operate all the way down to five watts. And so this chip is a miracle of a little computer and it's designed 
to operate, compute the autonomous computing stack. From this chip, we have created a new family we call the <coughs> NVIDIA AGX. Whereas that's the DGX, this is the AGX. This is an autonomous computing platform. And Xavier is designed to be scalable. So you could have multiple Xaviers, and you can connect Xaviers to Turing's. And together, they create a family of processors that goes from just a few watts all the way up to 320 trillion operations per second. 320 operations per second is approximately 600 MacBooks. Okay, that's a lot of notebooks. And so all of that fitting into one little computer. Extremely high speed IO. The first product that we're, going, we're creating is a new platform targeted at the $100 billion radiology market. This market is going completely software defined. And the reason for that is the algorithms that they use for medical imaging for radiology and pathology is so complicated these days. So much comp computational um, algorithms necessary to, to do this. Uh, all of these machines that I'm mentioning here are already based on CUDA, whether it's ultrasound or CT or MRI, whether it's um, uh, gene sequencers, digital pathology. This one I really love, the Cryo EM. This one won the Nobel Prize last year. Uh, the ability to image extremely, extremely small molecules to understand how they work. And the basic pipeline, the basic pipeline of imaging is like this. You have high-speed sensor comes, comes in, you do image reconstruction. Um, we haven't done it today, until today, but basically you can do AI, and I'm gonna show you that in just a second, and you visualize it. This is basically the pipeline of medical imaging. They're all largely the same. They're all largely the same. Okay, different modality sensors, but the goal is largely the same. The computation is very, very different, and just requires an enormous amount of computation. And so Nick, why don't we show it to him? Mike, is it you? Yep. Okay, go. All right, so we have on here, on the left, is a uh, forced back propagation reconstruction of a CT scan of the human chest. And this is a type of uh, scan that you'd see um, installed most places around the world um, if you were to go into a hospital. And uh, as you can see, we are not trained radiologists, so it's kind of tough to tell what's going on here in the middle area. So why don't we add in uh, some of our computational power with a new technique, uh, which is an iterative reconstruction technique. Okay, so Mike, this, give me a second, just excuse me for a second. So this, this um, filtered back projection uh, algorithm runs on one CPU, 20 core CPU, and takes about 20 seconds. Okay, so this new form of computation, iterative reconstruction, obviously is a multi-pass um, algorithm, enhances the resolution tremendously. Now this takes, one CPU, 30 minutes. So this takes 20 seconds, and this takes 30 minutes. This takes 30 minutes. On our GPU, on our GPU, it takes a few seconds. Okay? So 20 seconds on a CPU, 30 minutes on a CPU. If you run on a GPU, run on Clara AGX, it takes a few seconds. All right? But that's not all. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. All right, if we bring in uh, some AI into the mix, we can actually classify each voxel into what organ it is. And that's what we're seeing here. Each color represents a different organ. We have the, the kidneys over here on the right, green for bone, uh, blue for the lungs, and um, the heart right here in the center is pink. You guys know what just happened, right? What just happened is this. We train a neural network to recognize all that fuzzy stuff from that fuzzy stuff what are organs? What went into this artificial intelligence network is this fuzzy stuff. What came out are organs in different colors. The colors are not representative of real life. The, and and so, so these organs, these organs are segmented in 3D volumetrically by an AI network learned from that. Really, really amazing, okay? Go ahead. But that's not all. We can. Uh, and that's not all? <laughs> we can add in some realistic lighting and material properties to get a cinematic rendering of this. Oh, oh, excuse me. And that is going to be on the right. Here. There it is. And this is what, what happens when you use a computer that's also good at computer graphics. 
You guys might know this, but we're good at computer graphics. And so this is, ladies and gentlemen, before, before, and after. Before and after. This is better, huh? <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I gotta say something. A lot of AI is not possible today if not for some groundbreaking work that was done right here in Munich. Jürgen Schmidhuber's lab was right here, and this is the home of the invention of the LSTM, time series based AI network. And I gotta tell you something, I think I just saw him in the audience. Jürgen, come on, stand up for a second. Don't be shy, you're not shy. Ladies and gentlemen, Jürgen Schmidhuber. No, no, sit, sit down. You're not. <laughs> sit down, sit down. I didn't mean to give you the mic. I love you, man. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, Project Claire. I'm super excited to announce. I'm super excited to announce that we have some partnership that that uh, uh, that we formed in in advancing medical medical science, and um, uh, we have a partnership with uh, King's College of London, and we're working with them to, on the entire end, front to back, of medical imaging. From the computational infrastructure, to tools to democratize AI, to all of the researchers who are doing medical imaging research, to model stores so that uh, uh, doctors from multiple universities could work together. They're one of the 20 top medical research universities in the world. And, and then finally, um, infrastructure to deploy uh, this into clinical use. And so we're working with them from an end-to-end -end perspective to apply artificial intelligence and accelerated computing to the entire pipeline of medical imaging. I'm also delighted to announce that Oxford Nanopore is using NVIDIA's processors for Nanopore genome sequencing. And basically what you're seeing here is they created this really super way of doing genome sequencing. It's got this protein that, that separates this, this polymer. And this protein, another protein, guides one strand of DNA, okay? One strand of DNA to this, what is called a nanopore. There's electricity, ionic current, that's flowing through there somehow. I'm not exactly sure how. And, and then what happens is when all these base pairs go through it one at a time, the ACTG is going through it, it changes the profile of the current. And so the current changes, and when the current changes from its normal state, it looks like this. It's a whole bunch of fuzzy signals. And so they apply deep learning, they apply deep learning, and they run it on AGX, and what comes out of it is genome sequenced. Okay? Super complicated technology. That's all I understand. But the, the thing that's really amazing is this. Look at the size of that sequencer. This is where they take the sample. Hey, who has my sequencer? Guys, I lent it to somebody. I asked for it back. Oh. <laughs> Guys, here's a, here's, a, here's a gene sequencer. It's not a big refrigerator. It's this little thing. So this is where you take the sample. Imagine like this. Okay, so they take this out into the field. And apparently, um, certain crops in Africa, really essential to, 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 to people in Africa, uh, white flies, could, uh, carrying virus could completely disrupt the, the crops, kill the crops. And so this allows them to detect early whether a particular crop has been contaminated and before it spreads, they could pull it out. And so they, they take a sequence, they take a sample, and in just a few minutes, you connect this to a cable, and this is the sequencer. In just a few minutes, they sequence that, that gene, and they could tell whether that plant has been affected by the virus. Okay, Oxford Nanopore. We're all gonna have one someday, it's gonna be great. Okay, all right, I wanna talk about robotics real quick. We have a platform called Isaac, and basically the way it works is this computer runs a software stack, and the software stack senses the, the sensors, it has to uh, do perception of its environment, has to reason about where it's at, it's gotta plan what it needs to do, and then it navigates around. And it has to, it has to because it's working with people, 
it has to, and, and, and a clo close pro proximity to us, it has to understand our pose, which is what our intentions are, how we're standing, and what we intend. And so it has to interact with the, the environment. We call this platform Isaac. Now, of course, a robot, unlike a car, is very, very difficult to train um, for the road. And the reason for that is because for the car, your goal is to avoid collision with anything. In the case, and, and, and most of the world is largely structured. You've got lanes, you've got stop signs, you've got lights. In the case of a robot navigating through an environment, that, that's just not true. All the environment is changing all the time. And so we have to create a simulator where the robot, Isaac, can learn how to be a robot. So we create a virtual reality simulator where Isaac can be Isaac, learn how to be Isaac, and then when we're done with it, we take that, that software, we put it into a real computer, and hopefully Isaac does what it did in the virtual reality simulator. So let's play it. Okay. And so, if you're not sure, that was the simulator and that's reality. I know it looks awfully close. Okay, so, and that's, that's NVIDIA's new headquarters. And, and, uh, they, and, uh, and Carter, which is the little robot, delivered a uh, salad to me. And so today, we're announcing that this developer's kit, the Jetson AGX Xavier developer kit, is available. And it's got all this great software on top of it. It's got all this great software on top, and it's got the simulator that you can use. And the simulator could be connected to a hardware platform running the software, and it's like hardware in the loop running the simulator. So you have the simulator, you've got all this incredibly great software that, that you can use. It's got uh, people detection and segmentation, uh, stereo disparity or depth, depth uh, detection, uh, you have odometry and, and slam and localization, and you have path planning. So you got all these different algorithms and so much more. Pose estimation, people detection, voice recognition, voice synthesis, all part of this library we call the Isaac, Isaac SDK. Okay, and so from that, hopefully we're going to enable a whole lot of people to develop robots or a autonomous machines. Well, it turns out there's just thousands of projects around the world. And the reason for that is is because there's just not enough people to do certain tasks. There aren't enough farmers. There's not enough construction workers. There are not enough people who work in warehouses. The demand on these work, these industries are so great that autom automation is essential to the growth of these industries. And so farmers, if they just had automatic farming equipment to go out and help them pick out weeds and and, um, uh, and spray insecticide in the right places or sort through cucumbers or whatever it happens to be, the productivity of farmers will be greater and hopefully there'll be more farmers. And so there are so many different industries that this serves. We decided to partner with the world's largest electronic distributor that can reach all of these markets. Founded in 1935. You guys, can, I'm about to tell you, I'll give you the statistics, you, you guys can decide whether you know the company. Founded in 1935, 150,000 customers in all of the world's largest industries, industrial companies, 8,000 employees, 
3,000 of them are system engineers that assist customers. $26 billion large. So ladies and gentlemen, we're partnering with Arrow to take the Jetson kit, this autonomous Isaac development kit, and the system to companies and industries all over the world. Okay, thank you very much. I have one more autonomous machine I want to share progress with you. Every year I come back, I give you guys an update on our autonomous self-driving car. And um, we made a lot of progress. We made a lot of progress. And I'll explain why we made so much progress in just a second. But self-driving cars, self-driving cars is an autonomous machine. And its processing pipeline is exactly as I've described for medical imaging, is exactly the same as I've described for robotics. It's exactly the same again. It's sensor processing of all different types of modalities, perception to understand this environment, to reason about where it is, localization, to reason about where everybody else is and will be, prediction, and then to plan a path, path planning, to navigate the car to its destination. The autonomous computing loop. This whole thing is running continuously. And we want, to, we want to run this loop as fast as possible. Because if we run it fast, the car will be more alert. If the car is more alert, it can react faster, stay out of harm's way. It would be more comfortable. Not only that, because these cars, even when it fails, it can't fail. Unlike a notebook PC, even when it fails, it can't fail. The concept of hanging is out of the question. And so this computer has to be designed in a way that enables functional safety using redundancy and diversity. Redundancy and diversity. There's a whole lot of different ways we do the same thing. And so notice I described we have so many different processors in Xavier. The reason why there's so many different types of processors is because we want to do computer vision with one type of processor. We'll do it again with deep learning. We'll do it again with another method. We want to do localization using deep learning. We want to do localization in other ways, using odometry. We want to do localization, maybe even against an HD map. And so we do it in all these different ways, and we fuse it together. We fuse it together to improve our results and to not rely on any one algorithm, to not rely on any one sensor, to not, one, to not rely on any computing block. As a result, as a result, our progress has been incredible. It's an enormous amount of software. The future software, the future autonomous driving cars are essentially a software-defined car. And so we have to make our platform super programmable. Super programmable doesn't mean you write things in assembly code. Super programmable means you need to have an environment that allows you to be very productive in developing software. The tools have to be great. The infrastructure for deep learning has to be excellent. And our ability to quickly deploy, experiment, deploy, experiment, deploy, enhance, exp that loop has to be incredibly fast. One of the most important parts of any development process for autonomous machines, because the software is so complicated to do, is the simulation environment. And that's why we invested in this thing called DriveSim. What I'm about to show you is running on this system. It's called DGX Constellation. DGX Constellation basically is underneath, underneath, is a uh, imaging system. And so its job is to create the image of a virtual reality world. The image system, imaging system goes into a self-driving car. The, our drive system autonomous vehicle computer is in this box. The underneath box is generating the images for virtual reality. And this is the self-driving car driving it against this virtual reality. They run in a loop. Okay, so imagine if you're playing a video game, this is you, this is the video game, we're replacing you with an AI, okay? And let's see how it performs. So the first thing, the first thing that we have to do is this is an end cap test for all of the people in the audience. You might not know very much about machine learning, but I bet you knew a lot about end cap. Uh-huh. NCAP is basically a test to assure that a car could perform the necessary functions for things like autonomous emergency braking. 
and there's a whole bunch of tests. You have to take your car out to this track. How crazy. And so we created, and so, so by the way, if you ever go out to the track, all of their uh, balloon cars, all of their little mannequins, they've all been crashed terribly. They've been pasted back together with all kinds of duct tape, okay? And the reason for that is because obviously by the time they take it out there, there's still a lot of bugs. And so, so they run over all of these things. But what, we do it here in virtual reality. And so we're running the entire end cap test. Here's a bicyclist. No harm will come to them. Okay? The reason why it stops so quickly, so late, is because this is an emergency, automatic emergency braking test. So this is end cap. Well, this is really cool. Don't hit that car. <laughs> you hit that car, you will be bankrupt. <laughs> okay, so we take we take basically end cap and we're gonna put it into we put it into our simulation. We're gonna essentially we're gonna create with two suit, a partner here in Germany, to create a driver's license, essentially, a driver's test, a huge scale driver's test, and we're going to put it all in the virtual reality, and we're going to let everybody use it. Okay, so in the future, before you, you pass your real driver's test and get your driver's license for your self-driving car, you're going to have to pass it in virtual reality. Okay, so we take this, now let's show you something else. This next demo we're going to show you so, so let's is this... This next demo we're going to show you, Mark, give me a second, okay? This next demo we're going to show you captures a loop in highway in Silicon Valley. 280 to 92 to 101 to 85, if anybody's taken it. This loop is like 80 kilometers long. We took the TomTom -Tom map, HD map, and we auto-generated this scene. Can you guys imagine this? We take this 8D map, which is a bunch of vectors, three-dimensional vectors. We take it and we auto-generate the scene. We auto-generate the scene, okay? And this is the virtual reality simulation of us in, our, in, in that loop. Now, this is what we do. We have these computers, one for every engineer. And whenever they're coding, whenever they're coding, they want to know how it's doing, they send it right into there. And bam, they're right here driving. They're driving this beautiful car. And they're, everything is autonomous. The entire self-driving car stack is exactly as is that will be in the car as it is in there. No code modification, hardware in the loop. So they develop their software, make whatever modification enhancements they want to make, and before they put it into a real car, they put it into a virtual car. And they simulate it like this and see how it goes. Okay? Now notice, notice the, 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 the highway actually has uh, bumps in it, just like it does in real life. And you guys might recognize some of, the, some of these highways. Mark, was there something that... I, I have a little surprise for you. If we could see the Roadrunner view as well. <laughs> no kidding. Okay, so this car is driving by itself on the autonomous driving stack we call Drive AV. Can you guys show us the Roadrunner view? Whoa. There we go. Okay. Okay. So... The entire drive stack is live, like you just said, and all the DNNs associated with the drive stack are running, so all the perception is going on as we're driving in this freeway. And so we're detecting the lanes, we're detecting the cars, we're detecting the signs. Go and, ahead. And the cool, the surprise of this thing is that lane detection isn't actually lane detection, it's localization. So we're localizing ourselves in the real world. Localizing to an HD map? That's right. And okay. so those lanes are coming from the HD map based upon where, where the car discovered itself or lo localized itself. It's pretty cool. That's really cool. But you know what? So, so this is just the first step. This helps our engineers develop the software. Of course, our goal is to drive it for real. And this is the exciting part. You know, this is, you could just imagine the exhilaration of an engineer who did all this stuff in virtual reality, and it's all working great. And then they take the software stack, you download it, and we OTA it right into the cars called BB-8. We OTA it directly into BB-8. And what we're going to show you now is the video we captured.
Guys, I'm sure this has never been done. This is a big deal. I can't wait to do it myself. This was only done a couple of days ago. And um, uh, the team's working so hard, I'm so proud of them. But, but you know what's really amazing? What's really amazing is this. This, all of this that you're looking at, this is not a demo. This is something you can get right now. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the whole kit is available for you right now. Isn't this the world's first production autonomous vehicle computer? This dev kit. <laughs> this dev kit comes with all of that software that I just mentioned. Whether you like it in QNX or Linux, you could have all of the software fully accelerated on all of our processors, the driving stack on top of it, perception, localization, planning. It just drove this highway loop end to end. We're not ready to open it up yet, but we will. Our simulator, this entire computer is production ready and auto grade, production silicon, auto grade. You take the drive stack, put it on top of this. Not only that, the drive IX stack is available for you to try. So your driver monitoring, your car with external cameras will be able to estimate the pose, recognize the pose of somebody outside. Your car will recognize what somebody outside is saying, gesturing. That somebody outside could be a construction worker that says, hold on, or turn right. The car will recognize people on the road. The car recognizes whether you're paying attention or not. This computer, although incre incredibly light, I'm making it look heavy. That's because, that's because I work hard already today. Paul. Uh. And so the Drive AGX Dev Kit, production silicon, Auto grade, the drive AV stack, the drive IX stack, come and get it. Let's go build self driving cars together. <laughs> I've got some really cool announcements. Ladies and gentlemen, Volvo has decided they're going to use this platform for their next generation level two. A level, yeah, go ahead. One of the fastest growing car companies in the world. Their CEO, Hawkins Samuelson, named the best CEO of the automotive industry last year. They have selected the NVIDIA Drive to be their next generation level two. A level two should be able to do everything, should be able to drive wherever we need to drive. That's our goal. We have a journey to go there yet. A level two should be able to perform and drive safely and drive comfortably and drive well in a whole lot of places, with the only exception that humans in the loop. 
and that the car is going to keep paying attention to us to make sure that we are in the loop. Otherwise, it should drive well. Level two doesn't mean it drives poorly. Level two only means that it's human in the loop. The level of technology, of course, is therefore much more affordable than what otherwise would be an autonomous taxi. But the capability of next generation level twos, we hope will be absolutely remarkable and we believe it will be. We have a couple years to go make it happen and to come and, uh, let's see, I think Henrik is on here. Henrik, come, come over here. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Henrik Green. He's the CTO of Volvo, the fastest growing car company in the world. Hi. Good to see you. Hi. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Hi. Good to see you too. You know, nobody, nobody declared they were going to go into the AV passenger own vehicle car earlier than you guys did. We were fast in that track. I Insane. Had, yes. Yeah. That was cool. And we have seen that for a while now. And what we're working on right now, really exciting, is the next generation car platform, which you are now talking about here. And we are, so we're reinventing our scalable architecture that the current models are all on. Now, Henrik, one of the things that you guys recognized really early on is that an autonomous car, a self-driving car, is a software-defined platform. Exactly. It's all about software. So, basically, the big changes we're undertaking is in the electrical architecture or more or less the software architecture of this new vehicle platform, the SPA2 platform. Mm -hmm. And as we're just talking about, we're centralizing, consolidating the software, including then, as you said, the level two pilot assist into our new core computer, mm -hmm. powered by your wonderful machine. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Henry, thank you for coming. Great. All right. Great to be here. It. Thank All you. Right. <laughs> Henry Green, Volvo, one of the fastest growing car companies in the world, car company known worldwide for their dedication to safety. And they realized that safety equals software, software equals computing. And in the future, the more computational horsepower you have, the more safety software you'll be able to create because of diversity and redundancy and the sophistication of the software involved. Also here to announce that Continental has chosen NVIDIA Drive AGX for level two to level three to level four to level five mobility as a service platforms. We're working with Conti across this entire range, working with customers all over the world from level two, level three, level four, and level five. From driverless shuttles, industrial automated equipment, trucks to passenger vehicles. Also delighted to announce that Vioneer and Zenuity has standardized on NVIDIA's drive platform for their autonomous vehicle strategy. Again, working across the entire range. We are now working with several hundred companies in the AV industry. What they all need is a powerful computing platform that is designed to do sensor processing, computer vision, deep learning, ability to support diversity of algorithms, created with functional safety in mind, has the ability to scale from a level two all the way to autonomous, autonomously driven, excuse me, robot taxi, driverless robot taxi, the ability to scale from passenger-owned vehicles to shuttles, to pickup trucks, to trucks. Everything in the, in the future that moves will have autonomous capability. And that's what we built Drive for. It's an open platform with software stacks that you can engage, whether you at level one operating system and middleware below, algorithms, or the entire self-driving car stack. It's completely open. Use all of it or none of it at all. And so, super excited about all the partners we're working with. So today, we talked about a couple things. We talked about, of course, which side? Turing, our next generation GPU, a giant leap. Turing is the first GPU that allows us to go into three new markets, to reinvent computer graphics, to do ray tracing, accelerated for film and photorealistic rendering, and as a universal GPU to scale out accelerated computing and deep learning computing into the entire data center. We have now introduced two new accelerated computing stacks for our architecture. One for hyperscale deep learning that I just mentioned, and one 
for one of the largest high-performance computing segments that has until now been unaccelerated machine learning and data sciences. These four accelerated stacks represent our high-performance computing platform. And then lastly, our brand new line of computers, autonomous machines, bringing AI out of the cloud and into the world, automating cars, instruments, medical in instruments, and robots to assist mankind. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to GTC. I hope you guys have a great conference, and we have one last little surprise for you. Thank you all for coming. And I, and I forgot to tell you, everything was done in real time. That was not a movie. All the reflections, all the shadows, everything was in real time. Thanks for coming, you guys. Have a great GTC.